New research on prehistoric humans is bringing modern scrutiny to the lives of some of our most distant ancestors. It's also revealing that much of what we thought we knew, particularly about women, may have had more to do with 19th century perspectives than the archaeological record. April Noel is a Paleolithic archaeologist at the University of Victoria, and she joins us now from Victoria, British Columbia, for more. Great to have you on our program. Professor, how are you doing today? I'm fine, thank you so much for, uh, thank you so much for having me. Not at all, it's a pleasure. Where did the notion, let's start from scratch here, where did the notion that perhaps our understanding of the way things were in prehistoric times might actually not be accurate and we really need to rethink that whole thing? Well, I think there's a number of different reasons. So first of all, a lot of the um, early models for human evolution were developed in the 1800s and they were based on work that um, people were doing that early ethnographers were doing when they uh, in, were going around the world and encountering different uh, hunter-gatherer groups and so on. A lot of that work was done by men and in those situations, the, the men who were doing this research had access to men in these hunter-gatherer communities. Often they weren't privy to the kinds of roles and secret knowledge and things like that that women were engaging in. Uh, and so, you know, by default, almost the, the ethnographies that they wrote, the reports that they wrote, really focused on, on the male perspective, male roles. And so then, when archaeologists were trying to make models for early human evolution and they were drawing from these early ethnographies for better or worse right that's also a bit problematic to do that directly but but they were using that information to make their their models of human evolution and so by default they were emphasizing the the male roles um so that's one reason and i think the the second reason is that uh you know, scientists are humans, right? They're they're a, a you know product of their culture. So what they see around them, you know, they write about what they know and they ask questions based on what they know. And so in the 1800s, it seemed very normal that um, women stayed stayed home and they um, took care of children, and that was their primary role. And so they tended to project that back into the past as well because it just made sense. It's it's what they knew about the world. And um, we call that presentism, you know, when you mm -hmm. kind of project what you know onto the past. And we still do that, but um, but certainly that was one of the one of the factors I would say for for why um, there there has been this real bias towards um, imagining our ancestral landscapes uh, being dominated by males and adult males in particular. In which case, how do you take the same ancient relics, the same ancient objects, fossils, etc., and how do researchers go about actually coming to different conclusions by looking at the same things? Well, that yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think it's because we're changing we're changing the narrative a little bit. We're asking different kinds of questions. So in the 1970s, there was really um, a bit of a sea change in archeology. span So not just in my field, but archeology span more broadly, where there was a rise of um, the archeology span of gender and feminist approaches to archeology, span uh, which really started to switch, you know, change up the conversation and to say, okay, well, there's, 50% of the population out there that we're consistently ignoring in our in our reconstruction. So what are women doing, you know? And one of my colleagues, Meg Conkey from, from uh, the University of California at Berkeley said, but it had to be more than just add women and stir, right? Like you can't <laughs> just suddenly throw them in and, and ask the same kinds of questions. We have to think about this in a more nuanced way. And that's really what um, we've been doing since the, the 1970s is really broadening this conversation to look at, um, to kind of look at different kinds of questions that we can ask. And so, um, and as part of this sort of diversifying voices. So we're looking at, at what different sexes are doing. We're looking at different constructs of ge gender, for instance, and not, and again, not kind of um, projecting just this binary of uh, male femaleness onto the past, but to say, how did, how does, 
how did they construct gender? How does that relate to um, biological sex and so on? And looking at people of different ages, different ethnicities, and that kind of thing um, to get a more sophisticated and richer understanding of the past. So that's one of the main things is that we've really changed the conversation. And I think that's really important. And then along with that and what you'll see or what your viewers will see in the in the documentary that follows is that we've also got some new techniques for looking at these old bones. Uh, so in other words, um, usually when we're sexing a skeleton, when we're trying to assign sex to a skeleton, we look at the overall skeleton, we look at the overall shape of different parts of the body, um, and the pelvis is the most important. And as your viewers will see, uh, that was sort of a reanalysis of the pelvis is what, what really changed um, the uh, diagnosis of one of the skeletons they talk about right at the beginning. Um, but well, let beyond... Me, this, let let me jump in there because uh, mm -hmm. I want to give people a sneak preview of what we've got showing up later oh, tonight. Okay. Lady oh, Sapiens great. is the name of the documentary. It's coming on right after this program. Sheldon, a sneak preview if you would. In fact, one of the skeletons found at this 27,000 year old site was a woman. We have to think back to a society in the 19th century when women were not highly regarded. The women were at home, and men played all the important economic and social roles. So naturally, it was assumed that roles were similar in the Paleolithic era, that it was solely the male hunter who advanced society. The female was simply forgotten. We did not talk about her. And if she was mentioned, she was simply the homebody who took care of the children. And of course, the documentary goes on to say that is a misinterpretation, and we now can uh, definitely reinterpret much of what our understanding was in the past. Uh, my yeah. question, though, emerging from that is, how, mm -hmm. how reliable do you think any new interpretation of the past, even with our scientific advances today, how reliable can it be? Um, well, I think, you know, there are two things. So definitely our techniques are getting better and better for being able to uh, sex these skeletons, for being able to age them and so on. We're finding new discoveries that really help us to, to understand the data uh, or to, to broaden our understanding of the past and so on. Um, but of course, we're always going to be impacted by by the culture in which we're, we're living, right? So we're always going to be influenced uh, in that way in terms of the kinds of questions that we ask. Um, but I, I do think that we, we do know so much more about uh, our early human evolution than we ever did before. Um, being able to um, do to extract DNA from these fossils, for instance, is opening a whole new world in terms of, of not only aging and so on, but uh, knowing more about uh, whether how related different people were, whether people married outside their local communities, uh, you know, just all in the kinds of diseases they had and what they look like. I mean, it's changing our understanding of skin color, eye color, all sorts of things like that about our, our past. So I'm actually quite um, optimistic about how much we can know and about all the incredibly exciting questions that come out of these new uh, technologies. Good to know. Let's, uh, again, I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osman, to bring up a photo here, and I'll have you comment on this. This is Venus. The Venus figurine, uh, one of the earliest known depictions of a human being. Now start by telling us how has this been evaluated in the past? Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> this is, how long do you have? <laughs> this is one of my favorite, <laughs> uh, one of my love-hate kinds of artifacts. This is the Holofell figurine uh, from Germany, and it's about 35,000 years old, and it's made of mammoth ivory. Um, and uh, first of all, I, I try to not use the term Venus. Uh, Venus figurine is something that's in, in pop culture, uh, but it has uh, a lot of, uh, it has a, an, a sort of a, a racist history and so on to why it's used. So I use, tend to use the word figurine uh, for them. But uh, when this one was first published, it was really interesting. Um, it was uh, present, so it was published in the journal Nature, which is the most 
prestigious journal in the world for science. So along, along with the journal science, they're the top two. And when it was published, they had a website that went along with it and they referred to it. And this is this is nature, referred to it as a prehistoric pinup and a 35,000 year old sex object. Hmm. Right. And so this is um, shocking to me <laughs> that this would happen. And um, and then, of course, this went into the media and we had The Economist describing it as smut carved from a, from mammoth ivory and the sun calling it the first page three girl and all kinds of terrible things, you know, and and I was just really perplexed by this. And my colleague and I, uh, Melanie, Dr. Melanie Chang and I wrote a, a paper about how, you know, in modern times, I mean, this is only a few years ago, we could describe it that way. And so, and I realized that people were really focusing on the breasts and other sort of second, what we call secondary sexual characteristics, instead of really looking at this as a, as a, in a more nuanced way. So this figurine actually has lines on it that could be body tattooing. And, you know, as, as uh, Professor Nick Connard in your in the film you're gonna show talks about it. Like there's no way that this is an accurate representation of the female body. It's either emphasizing fertility or it's emphasizing uh, any number of things. If we look at um, animal figurines from the same period in the same region, they're also quite blocky. They've also got these engraved lines on them and nobody calls them pornographic, right? So um, I think it's really interesting that even in this day and age, we're still projecting back on our, our thoughts onto or our present values onto these objects. So we see breasts and we think, oh, that must mean pornography, right? Well, and it gets worse. Uh, shall, you know, I, shall, yeah. I, shall I show examples of them? I mean, this is obviously uh, uh, male interpretations overly sexualized of, of what this is supposed to be. And of course, it gets worse in Hollywood, as we'll also show in the documentary later tonight. Sheldon, next clip, please. In the era of early silent films, the prehistoric woman found herself portrayed as a simple trophy to be hunted and prized by males with primal needs. Later, in post-war Hollywood films, the prehistoric woman resembled the fantasy woman of the era, with long, luscious hair, shapely legs, amble breasts, and decked out in a tiny, tiny bikini. It says a lot about the fantasy that men have about women. These are fantasies that have endured for a long time, two roles of a woman, the seductress on one side and the protective mother on the other. Um, okay, full confession. Uh, I like looking at Raquel Welch as much as the next guy, but um, but how? I mean, you've got a tough job, I presume, to try to change a narrative that has been in place for hundreds of years, maybe more, right? Absolutely, yeah, and um, it, it's it's true. And and when we published that paper, and I later did a, a TEDx talk on on that same figurine, the reactions to it were quite um, you know lots of people loved it, and they're like, yeah, this is the kind of study that we needed to have done, and and others were like, oh, you're you know you're you're protesting too much. Clearly, you know, cave cavemen, you know, were were interested in in you know the female form and so on, and I think that like really isn't the point. I think the, the point is that as as it said in, in that clip, we tend to really regular, you know, we tend to to say that women only had one of two roles. And I think that actually the archaeology is really starting to show um, and it shouldn't be surprising to us, but maybe it is. It's a, it's really beginning to show that there are so many different ways in which women were able to uh, contribute to their communities. And so uh, one of the people they interview in the film is James Adabasio, and I I really liked his his interview. I thought it was one of the most important ones there because he said so much of what we look at in the archaeological record, or so much what we think about the archaeological record, is determined by in our field, anyways, the stones and bones that we find. So the the bones of large game animals and the stone tools, because that's what preserves really well. And he made the point that in fact, you know, the vast majority of artifacts in hunter gatherer societies are made 
made of perishable materials. And to a large extent, we don't, um, we're not recovering those, except in these fortuitous, uh, you know, occasions or situations. And, but actually his work with Olga Sofer, who you, they also mentioned in the film, um, has actually shown that there's an incredible textile um, industry dating back 25,000 years ago. We have strands of, of spun, spun dyed flax, for instance, we have imprints of textiles uh, that show that there were nets, there were bags, there were, um, there's, you know, fine clothing, we have these beautiful mammoth bone needles, those are kinds of, you know, technologies that women are often engaged in, uh, from what we can see around the world. Uh, he well, let me jump in on that if I can, because I, I know the documentary yeah. uh, posits the idea that some of the work would have been so fine, some of the beading, for example, mm. that, that sort of fatter male fingers just simply couldn't have done it. So obviously, <laughs> women did, right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's quite possible. Again, if we're looking sort of ethnographically, uh, we do have a lot of examples of women making this kind of work, but I wouldn't say exclusively. So I'm a little hesitant to say that women only made, made these beads. Um, I tend to worry that we may go to the opposite extreme in some of our interpretations to say mm. women did everything. Um, but I would say definitely that we can't exclude them by any means. And I would also, because I'm someone who studies the archaeology of children, I would also say say that it's possible that children did some of this work too because children in many different societies um, uh, are known to, to do some of the, the fine work that requires tiny hands as well. Gotcha. Is there any evidence uh, that you or your colleagues have come across that suggests that women had some modicum of control over their reproductive lives all those years ago? Uh, well, you know, it's, it's uh, interesting. So I wouldn't be surprised if they if they had an understanding of the relationship between uh, sex, for instance, and, and pregnancy, I mean, I think they would make that connection and they would probably also, you know, see it in the natural world. We usually think that doesn't happen until there's um, agriculture and domestication of animals, but I would imagine that it would come a bit earlier than that. And certainly there are ways to delay um, fertility, for instance, by extending breastfeeding or things like that. So there, there may have been some mechanisms in place if we can use analogies from uh, looking at people uh, around in traditional societies around the world. Hmm. And again, there may be an assumption that all of the cave paintings that have been found were probably done by men, but is there evidence to suggest that women contributed to uh, documenting their lives in cave paintings? Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, again, uh, those are one. This is one of those sea changes in our understandings. But people have done a lot of work looking at uh, handprints, in particular, that we find in these in these caves, and we know that some of them belong to women. We actually have men and women and children and adults as well. So we know that all different kinds of people were visiting the cave, that they were participating in the production of art. So again, I wouldn't say that women were doing all of the art because again, we don't know who is actually making the animal drawings at all, but we have to be able to, but now we know that that definitely women were there, that they were producing those, some of those handprints and there's absolutely no reason to think that they weren't doing you know some or more all of, of the art as well. How exciting is it for you? I mean, this is your living. This is of interest to, to those people watching this right now, but this is how you make your living. How exciting is it to you that tens of thousands of years after the fact, we can, we can experience profoundly new understandings of how the world used to work? I think I have the best job in the world, frankly. <laughs> I feel like, um, yeah, I get to ask the big questions about what makes us human and, and those kinds of things. And just uh, every single day, uh, almost, there's some brand new discovery that makes me think, oh my God, I have to go back and change uh, something. I just wrote a, a book on, on uh, Paleolithic children called Growing Up in the Ice Age. And the minute um, I sent in the final proofs and we were done, uh, all these different discoveries came out of the, you know, one of the, the oldest homo sapien uh, burials was a child and all this. So that I keep throwing all these new discoveries in a file that I jokingly call second edition, right? Because everything is changing so quickly. And so I think I'm in a, I'm, 
I've got this amazing job at this amazing time where, where the, our technology is just opening up so much for us. And so over the next few years, really, um, things that I thought were absolutely impossible to know, I think are now opening up to us. So we now know women back then did far more than simply have the children and raise the children. They hunted, they foraged. What other things did they do that sort of put a lie to our understanding of the narrative of the way things have been? Well, I think again that that textile industry. I think probably women were also involved uh, in ceramics. So, um, and I would also like to to kind of emphasize that when we say you know they did more than raise children, I would say that actually that is a, a hugely important part of what they were what they were doing, in the sense that um, we talk about a maternal instinct as if. You just handed someone a baby and they would know what to do <laughs> with, with it. And we actually know that there's so much more skill to that instinct, that there's so much more learning that has to, to happen. Uh, and that it's, it's this huge skill set. So I think we, I, at the same time as I don't want to uh, say that's all they were doing, I want to emphasize how important and complex uh, that caregiving was, uh, but then to say, yeah, they were doing all these other things. If we think that um, that they were largely responsible for the gathering and probably for a lot of the small game hunting, not to say they weren't doing any large game hunting, but a lot of the small game hunting, then we're talking about 60, 70 percent of their of the communities. Um, subsistence is being provided by women, and I think that's hugely important. And all without ever reading what to expect when you're expecting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the Stone Age version of that. <laughs> exactly. Well, I, I, you know, after having watched the documentary, and I hope people will stick around and watch it tonight, I do wonder two and three and four hundred years from now how they mm -hmm. are going to come to even newer and more exciting interpretations of what you and your colleagues are doing right now. That's really going to be something. April Noel, it's so uh, mm -hmm. wonderful of you to join us here on this International Women's Day. Professor of Anthropology, University of Victoria, thanks for joining us on the line from BC. Thank you so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Good night. <laughs> the Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.